you. Amen. Oh, that's loud. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory. Amen. This morning, can you just give God praise for the victory? We walk in victory. We don't pray for victory. We pray from a place of victory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you that you are the good shepherd. We hear your voice and we follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated this morning. Wow. Technology. Thank you to our worship team. Thank you to our sound guys. Can we just thank them for what they do every week? And we often joke and say gremlins get into the sound system. I think that happened this morning. Thank you guys for what you do. I know it's pressure back there for our media team, our sound, our sound team. Well, welcome everyone this morning. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. And it's a privilege for me to bring the word this morning on a very special day, Mother's Day. I want to take a moment to honor all our mothers in the house. Can you stand if, let me say, you are a mother, a grandmother, a stepmom, a spiritual mom, a stand-in mom, or a mom-to-be. Can you stand this morning? Can we honor these mighty women of God in the house? Amen. I want to say every one of you are special. You are loved and you are needed. So I honor you this morning. Thank you for what you're doing for your children, whether your own or those that God has brought into your care. You leave an indelible imprint that impacts a generation. I want to thank the company of women in this house that I get to watch and learn from. Some of you aren't even aware of it at times, but I'm learning from your example and from your life. And I want to thank those that have spoken into my daughter's life, lives. I'm so grateful we don't get to do this on our own. God puts us in family like this where we can help each other. So I honor you and I applaud you this morning. Can we just give our moms another hand? <clears throat> Thank you, ladies. I just want to take a moment as well this morning to honor my mom. Yes. Yes. Can you stand for me, mom? I want to thank you publicly for your life of love and sacrifice, not only for my dad, for my brother and myself, for your grandchildren, but for our church family. <clears throat> Through the years, I have watched your sacrifice, your labor of love, the way you have served God and his people with such passion and compassion. And as I watch you get older, you're still young, but as I watch you get older, I see your fire burn more intensely. When I look at you, I see a woman of great faith. I see a woman who loves Jesus with her whole heart. I see a woman that loves God's word. I see a woman who fights her battles on her knees. An example to me, mom, and to many others. And so this morning, I want to say that I love you, I honor you, and I appreciate you. Church, can we pray together this morning as I open with the word? Father, this morning... We thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house. God, we never want to take it for granted. And so, Lord, I commit this time to you. 
I thank you for your word that does not return void. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would divide your word 250, 280 ways. Lord, you know every heart, you know every need, you know every circumstance, and you know exactly how to speak to us wherever we may find ourselves. And so, Lord, I ask this morning as we come, we give you our hearts afresh this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister to hearts. May you open up our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Holy Spirit, will you get our full attention even now? No distractions. Full attention, I pray. And Lord, I ask that you anoint me this morning. Anoint my lips, Lord, I need you this morning. And Father, I ask as I speak your word, may it bring honor and glory to you. Lord, may it be like an arrow that hits the target with such precision, I pray. And Lord, I ask your word this morning would move us, transform us, challenge us, I pray. Move us to action, I ask. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, church, this morning, um, as I share the word, I want to say up front, not a typical Mother's Day message, so please forgive me, moms, but we'll be honoring you at the end of the service, although I do believe it has a strong message to our moms. The Lord laid on my heart the story of Esther for this morning, and it was a bit of a strange one because Esther is not known as her role as a mom, who of you know that. Nonetheless, she was a powerful woman in Scripture, and she's been taught about often and preached about often, but this morning, I want to highlight not only Esther, but the life of Mordecai. I believe God wants to highlight the significance and the eternal impact when generations come together for one cause. And so I'm going to highlight three characters specific this morning in the book of Esther. And I want to say, please don't limit it to a man or a woman or even ages. I believe that these characters speak to each one of us under the sound of my voice. So if you're willing to do that, I believe God will say something to you today. These characters have strong lessons that we can draw from. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to read the whole book of Esther, um, but I encourage you to. There's only 10 chapters, so you can go home and read it in your own time. But this morning, I'm going to be drawing parts from chapters 1 through to chapter 7. So follow with me, because I'm going to be jumping around a little, okay? So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read, but I want to sketch a story for you, just so you have a bird's eye view of what's taking place here. So there are Jews living in Babylon under the Persian rule. They have a king named Azurus, and he's married to Queen Vashti. At some point, Queen Vashti disobeys the king, and she is dethroned. And there is a quest to find a new queen. While Esther, a young Jewish girl, finds favor with the king and his crowned queen. However, there is a man named Haman that shows up. Haman is a Bible day Hitler. He hates the Jewish people. And he has a good point to note, church, that hatred unchecked will lead to murder. So his hatred is fueled by a Jewish exile named Mordecai, who happens to be Esther's guardian. While well, Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman, and in his fury, Haman plots a holocaust and a decree is signed to kill the Jewish people. Mordecai speaks into Esther's life and positions her to be part of God's plan. She risks her life to save her people. The curse is reversed and Haman is destroyed. What we see from Scripture is God uses two unlikely people. Mordecai, a Jewish exile, and Esther, a young orphan girl to rescue his people and to lead a nation into freedom. Throughout history, 
God has used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he continues to use people willing to position themselves and co-labor with him for his purpose and his redemptive plan. So now that you know the story of Esther in a nutshell, I want to highlight the first character this morning. Her name is Queen Vashti. In Esther chapter 1 verse 10, it says, On the seventh day, King Azurus commands Queen Vashti to come into his presence. Verse 12 says, But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. Interesting scripture. She knew protocol. She knew what she needed to do. However, she refused to submit to his lordship and his authority. Queen Vashti is led by her own feelings. And the bottom line is, she just doesn't show up. I want to ask this morning, church, how many of you know how important it is to show up in life? Right? It is a value that is vital, but it requires leadership of self. You cannot lead others until you are able to lead yourself. And it is important to show up in life even if you don't feel like it, even when it's hard. You see, her looks got her into her position, but her character could not sustain her there. She forgets that she is only a queen because she married a king. And this is a good reminder to us, church, this morning. We are only who we are because of his great love. We only sit here this morning because of his great love. Everything you have, he gave you. Every talent you have is God-given. And every opportunity is by his grace. Favor is always given for a purpose. The problem with Queen Vashti is she uses what's being given to her and her position of leadership for her own personal agenda and satisfaction. While the king is calling for her, she's throwing her own party. She does not use her position to serve others, instead to serve herself. And church, just for a moment this morning, I want you to consider where you are in your own life. Because each one of us have been placed in positions of influence, whether you believe it or not. I speak to the mother of a young child at home to the CEO of a company, to the doctor caring for his patients, to the nurse caring for the sick, to the domestic worker cleaning someone's home, to the teacher in the classroom, to the students in the school or the varsity. Every one of us have the opportunity daily to influence our environment and our atmosphere. You carry the presence of God. And God has blessed you with skills, talents, and resources, not for your personal gain, church, but to bless others. In Genesis 12, verse 2, God says to Abraham, I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing, a source of good to others. Queen Vashti loses everything. She's dethroned. And God raises someone else who is willing to give answer to the call. I want to say, church, God will fulfill his plan on the earth with or without us. We don't have to work with him. We get to work with him. And it is a privilege for you and me. I want to encourage you this morning. Don't be like Vashti. Don't use what God has given you for yourself, but to serve others instead. Use what is in your hand. Use your position of influence to impact your environment. 
and learn to show up. Amen. The next two characters that I want to speak about this morning is Esther and Mordecai, and these two display teamwork. There is unity between these two, and what they are able to accomplish together is far greater than what they would have done on their own. Well, Esther, like I said, is a Jewish girl. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah, and she's left as an orphan when her parents die at a young age. Mordecai, who is her older cousin, takes Esther in as his own. Chapter 2 of Esther, verse 20 says, And Mordecai took her as his own daughter. I want to pause this morning. And I want to ask if there is anyone in the house this morning that has taken in a child that is not your own. Not someone you have given birth to. Whether it be a friend, a family member, whether it be through a foster or an adoptive process. Whether you have done it or you are in the process of doing it. Can I ask you to stand this morning? Look around, church. Look around this morning. I honor you this morning. We honor you. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion is those that care for the widows and the orphans. I want to thank you this morning for opening your heart and your home to be able to care for someone else's child. Thank you for shaping generations. Thank you for shaping legacy. Thank you for speaking into another child's life. I honor you this morning. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, Queen Vashti is dethroned, and there is a search for a new queen. Mordecai positions Esther carefully. He speaks counsel and wisdom into this young girl, and the interesting thing is, is he doesn't remind her of where she's come from. He doesn't remind her of her past. She has not yet seen her worth, but he has. And he starts to call it out. He starts to position her correctly that she would be able to stand in her position as queen. While Esther and all the other young girls go through a 12-month preparation process. That's a long time. You're not even sure what the outcome will be. But for 12 months, it says they go through a preparation and for six months, they soak in oils, and for six months, they soak in perfumes. The Persian law was very strict around women being attractive. So much time and effort and finances were spent on external beauty. Doesn't it sound familiar to our culture today? Selfie society that spends so much time on the outward appearance, that which fades but void of inner beauty, character, and depth. 1 Peter 3, 3 to 4 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair, wearing gold, and putting on expensive clothing, but rather let it be the inner beauty, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and peaceful spirit. Church, just like Esther... God takes us through a process of preparation before our time of promise and promotion. How many of you are in a process of preparation? You may not even know it, right? And what he does in this process is he refines. Whew, it's painful. Because there's a fire needed for refining. He refines us and he tests us to develop character needed to successfully steward the fulfillment of the promise. Can I say that again? In the process, God refines and he tests us 
to develop character needed to successfully steward the fulfillment of the promise. See, God wants to work in you so that he can work through you. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you're in a season of refining, of testing, the heat has been turned up, the pressure is on, can I get an amen in the house? I encourage you, I exhort you this morning, keep at it. Don't give up. Don't stop short of the completion of the process. Well, Esther finds favor with the king at the end of this preparation, and she's promoted to the position as queen. But, uh, but, don't you hate that when it, but. But there is Haman that steps onto the scene. Now, like I said earlier, Haman is a Bible time Hitler. He hates the Jewish people, but this is nothing new, right? Throughout history, Satan tried to thwart God's plan, redemptive plan for mankind, but time and time again, God raises up men and women who are willing to stand in the gap. Those who are committed to see his purpose and his intention established. Well, Haman has this high executive position in government. He oversees the princes, and so in other words, he carries some influence and some authority. And a rule is made that everyone must bow to Haman. But there is a man. I love that. But there is a man named Mordecai who refuses to bow. He's a righteous man in an unrighteous culture, and he has a moral conviction that he will bow to no one but God. We need some more Mordecais in our day. Amen. Amen. And he's respectful. He's not rebellious until he's expected to bow. And church, there are certain things worth fighting for in life. We cannot just go with the flow. We will confront some Hamans in our life. And let me tell you, they hate Christians. They hate truth. They hate God's word. And what they want is to distort truth and to cause you to compromise. Because when we stand for nothing, we'll fall for everything. And so they try to bring compromise into our life. Edmund Burke says the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men do nothing. Well, Mordecai was a good man, and he refused to be pressurized by culture. In Esther 2 verse 5, it says, In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shami, son of Kish, the Benjamite. Bit of a strange verse in the middle of this chapter. How many of you know sometimes you get to those lineages and you're like, oh, I'll just skim over that have no clue what they're talking about, not relevant. Well, let me say this is really relevant, and I'll explain why. Follow with me, church. Mordecai is the descendant of Kish. And Kish was the father to King Saul, right? Haman is a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Now, if you know Old Testament history, Amalekites were always enemies to the Israelites. In every generation, God says to the Israelites to utterly destroy the Amalekites. In 1 Samuel 15 verse 18, it says, Samuel is now speaking to, the king, to King Saul and he says, Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Verse 20, Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. You see, King Saul is delusional because he says, I've completely destroyed them, but I've preserved the king. That wasn't God's instruction. Let me say, church, half obedience, delayed obedience is not obedience. 
We cannot manipulate the way we want things to go and then claim to have been obedient to God's, God's voice and what he's asked of us. Well, because of King Saul's disobedience, Mordecai now faces the same enemy his great-grandfather failed to destroy. There are some things that you may struggle with that never started with you. I don't know what's run in your family. From generation to generation, what I want to say today, church, until it runs into you. Be the Mordecai in your family that refuses to bow to the enemy that has gone after generations before you to destroy what God has called your family to. Be the Mordecai in your family. Well, Mordecai's decision not to buy fuels Haman's hatred. And a holocaust is planned and a decree is signed to annihilate the Jews. Who of you know that we are seeing this more and more, that as the church holds fast to truth, unapologetically, uncompromisingly, persecution is on the increase. But scripture says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Esther 3 verse 15 now says, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command. And the decree was proclaimed so that the king and Haman sat down to drink. Very next verse says, Mordecai is in sackcloth weeping with a loud and a bitter cry. While they drinking, he's weeping. We need Mordecais who will weep for the injustices and the evil in society. The systems trying to pollute our children's minds, whether through entertainment, media, sex education, you name it, we have an enemy. And we need Mordecais who are willing to weep over the condition and the state of our culture and say, no, not on my watch. Not on my watch. I want to say this morning, I know that there are Mordecais in this house. You stand in the gap for our children, for our youth for our young adults, for the Esthers of today. You stand in the gap and you say, not on my watch. You weep over the state of society and culture. You weep at how our children are being polluted by the systems. You stand in the gap. You refuse to be indifferent. You fast and you pray for someone else's burden. Let me say, church, when a crisis hits your home, you need Mordecai's that will stand in the gap for you. You need people that are willing to fast and pray on your behalf. Like when Moses went to battle, Aaron and her lifted his arms as he became weary. And I want to honor the Mordecais in this house. I want to tell you, every child, every young person in this house, in our school, connected to Frontline Church, I guarantee you, is covered in praise. I guarantee you, is covered in praise. Because we have Mordecais that stand in the gap and say, not on my watch. Can we honor those that stand in the gap this morning? The world is in a crisis, but God is looking for men and women who will rise to the occasion, who refuse to be indifferent, casual, and complacent, and who say, not on my watch. I know I have a part to play. Well, Esther gets to hear 
about Mordecai weeping. And she sends a messenger to find out what is taking place. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 7, Mordecai responds and tells him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. Verse 8, he also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, there that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplications to him and plead before him for the people. You see, Mordecai didn't have access to the palace, but he knew the one who did. And he starts to position her for influence. Esther responds and she says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Esther basically responds to Mordecai and she says to him, the king hasn't called me. Mordecai, I cannot go. Church, I want to ask this morning, how many of you are not doing what God asked of you because you're waiting for a man to call you, to recognize you, to approve of you, to accept you? The king of kings already has. Stop looking to man. Look to God. Stop fearing man. And have a reverential fear of God. Oswald Chambers Chambers says, God did not direct his call to Isaiah. Isaiah overheard God saying, who will go for us? The call of God is not just for a select few, but for everyone. Whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. And exactly what I hear Depends on my spiritual attitude. Powerful quote. In Esther chapter 4, verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying to Esther, if you don't go, relief will come from somewhere else. Remember Vashti. He's reminding her of Vashti and he says, because she didn't show up, God raised someone else. But Esther You have the opportunity to be part of God's plan. Don't you know you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this? He's saying to her, don't you forget who you are. Hadassah, you are a Jew. Your name may have changed. Your position may have changed. But don't forget who you are and what you've been called for. Well, Esther responds in verse 15 and 16, and she says, Go gather all the Jews who are present to Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I always say that the condition of a man's heart or a woman's heart and their true character is revealed in a crisis. When your back's against the wall, what will your response be? Well, there are four qualities that I believe we can highlight from her response, and these reveal her heart and are necessary for every Esther in the room this morning. 
The first one is she has a teachable heart. Esther is willing to hear what she did not want to hear. Do you agree? That wasn't great news coming to Esther. It wasn't great counsel either, what she thought. But she's willing to hear what she does not want to hear. And Proverbs 13, 18 says, Whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame. But whoever heeds correction is honored. The second quality that Esther displays is she has an obedient heart. In chapter 2, verse 20, it says, Esther obeyed Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In other words, from a young age, she's learned to honor the one that God put over her. I want to say when we learn to respect, to honor, and to submit to those that God has placed over us, it will go well with you, and you will find favor with God and man. If you are not obedient, God cannot trust you. The third quality was a connected heart. You see, Esther doesn't try to fly solo. She knows she needs people around her. She says to to Mordecai, gather those around and call, call them to a fast. She recognizes that for her to accomplish what God has called her to, she cannot do it on her own. Church, let me tell you, being connected to people that are like-minded, that will call out your gift, that will encourage you and spur you on is necessary for you to be able to accomplish what God has called you to do. The fourth quality is she has a sacrificial heart. A heart that is surrendered to the will of God, placed on the altar and kept there. Because she says, if I perish well, then I perish. Where there is a call, there is a cost. And Esther realizes her life had far greater purpose than merely maintaining her own comfort or happiness. Her heart was turned from her own self-interest to the plans and the purposes of God. She took her eyes off of her own agenda and put them on God's eternal purposes. As a result, deliverance, comes to an entire nation. Church, don't underestimate what an impact your life can have. Don't underestimate. So I speak to the Esthers in the room this morning. Do you have a teachable, obedient, connected and surrendered heart? Are you willing to say, God, here's my heart, creating me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me? God, help me to endure the process of refining and testing so that I may develop the character needed to successfully steward the promise and that I may walk worthy of the calling. The difference between Vashti and Esther was that Vashti did not have a Mordecai in her life. You see, Esther had the same response, I'm not going but she has a Mordecai that speaks into her life. This past Friday, our family watched a movie called Brian Banks. Not sure if any of you have watched a fantastic movie, true story of a young boy, 16 years old, who is sentenced to prison for a crime he did not commit. And in prison, he meets what I would call a modern-day Mordecai, a mentor. This man comes alongside Brian Banks and he starts to speak into his life. He starts to remind him of his potential. He starts to challenge his mindset and the way he's thinking about himself and his future. And as Brian Banks in the story, true story, starts to reflect on his experience in prison, he speaks of this one man And he says this, him believing in me made the world of difference. Church, there is a generation of Esthers looking for a Mordecai. I want to say that again. There is a generation of Esthers who are looking for a Mordecai that will speak into their lives and say, don't forget who you are. 
It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't, what the, doesn't matter what the start was. It doesn't matter what's happened in your family. It doesn't matter how much you've messed up. I see you. I love you. I've got you. And don't you know you've been born for a time such as this? Mothers, will you be that Mordecai to your children? Will you shape them and cause their arrows to be sharp that you can release them into destiny? So often, we tell them what they shouldn't do instead of telling them what they should be doing what God's call is on their life, what their influence is, what they've been called to in this hour. There's a generation of Esthers looking for a Mordecai. And church, I want to say that this is something God has been showing me more and more within this church, that when the Mordecai stand up, the Esthers emerge. When the Mordecai stand up, Esther's emerge. I'm so grateful for the Mordecai's. I'm so grateful for the Mordecai's in my life that keep reminding me, don't forget. Don't forget. Remember who you are. Church, I believe God is calling Esther's this morning. He's wanting to birth something in you that will impact more than just yourself. And I don't know what it looks like for you. Maybe for our young people, it's bringing prayer into your school. Maybe it's for our young people saying, I'm going to live in purity and holiness. Maybe it's those that want to rescue victims from human trafficking. Maybe it's those that will bring finances into the kingdom. I don't know what it is exactly that God has stirred on your heart. But I want to say this morning, don't forget you've been born for a time such as this. I exhort the Mordecais and the Esthers this morning to arise, for you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this. Church, in closing this morning, I want to say that when you give your life to Christ, he makes sure nothing is wasted. Nothing. He uses the pain of the past for purpose. You may not see these dramatic events unfold, but let me say that God strategically moves you daily for his kingdom's sake. Don't underestimate the part that you play in God's grand design. If we can close our eyes this morning, church. And I want you just for a moment to reflect on the word. I'm not sure what has touched you this morning. Maybe it's just a reminder that you need to show up. Maybe God has nudged you to say, that thing that I've given you, it's for a purpose greater than yourself. Maybe this morning you needed some encouragement to continue through the process of preparation. Or maybe you've been stirred to say, I'm going to be a Mordecai that refuses to bow to pressure. I'll be the Mordecai in my family that stands face to face with the enemy. I refuse to be indifferent, complacent, or casual about the increasing evil in society. Or maybe this morning you needed a reminder to stop looking for man's approval and to look to God. 
Maybe you say, I'm an Esther and I need to get my heart right because I need to be obedient, teachable, connected and surrendered. Or God is stirring you to say, you have something to give to the Esther generation. You need to be that Mordecai that reminds others of their potential, their worth and their calling. I want to say today, respond to God's call. If that's you this morning, if any of these points have touched you this morning, I just want you to stand where you are. You don't have to come to the front. Just as an indication of saying, yes, today has been a good reminder for me. I want to be an Esther. I want to be a Mordecai. I want to give response to the call that God has placed on my life. Thank you, Jesus. So this morning, Lord, every person standing in this room, I pray a grace, Lord, upon their lives. Father, I thank you for your word this morning that has touched hearts in different areas. Lord, I thank you within this house, there will be the Mordecais and the Esthers that link arms and impact a nation. Lord, you have called us to this. You've said at Frontline, we will influence every atmosphere we land up stepping into. It's not by chance. You've positioned us there. Lord, you will call, you have called us and you are calling us to restore lives, my God, to transform our communities, our cities, our nation. Lord, here we stand this morning. We've heard the call like Isaiah overheard God saying, who will go for us? Lord, this morning, you see each one standing in this room and they're saying, God, we'll go. I'll go for your cause. Lord, I'll speak into the life of another person, of a young child, of a youth. I'll remind them of their calling, God. I'll be in the background, standing in the gap, warring on behalf of our children. My God, here I am. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you this morning. Give a grace, Lord. I pray for those who are going through the painful process, Lord. Where there's refining, where there's trials, where there's heartache. Lord, where they are this morning, I believe there's people this morning that have said, I'm so close to quitting. I'm so close to giving up. It's just too hard. I want to say this morning, stick at it. Persevere through God's grace meets you there. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by His Spirit. And Lord, I'm asking this morning an abundance of grace, Lord, an empowering of your Spirit on those that feel like quitting. God, help them. Help them. Strengthen them. Lord, align people next to them that will walk with them and hold their arms up in the battle, I pray, my God. Cause us to be connected. Cause us to see our life of so much value more and beyond just our own gain. Lord, our own purpose. Give us eyes to see beyond. Give us a heart to respond, Lord, I pray. Lord, I ask this morning, those that are in the process of adoption, I believe there's those that are struggling through the process of adoption. Lord, I'm asking your favor in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you open doors. Those that are waiting for paperwork, those that are waiting for approval. My God, I'm asking this morning that you make a way. And Lord, you assign to them the Esther that you've purposed for this season. God, help us as mothers, I pray, to be Mordecai's to our children. We'll sharpen their arrows, my God. Give us wisdom as we speak into their lives. Help us, Lord, to say, I see you and I love you. Maybe there's those this morning that say, I don't feel noticed. I don't know where I fit. This morning, God is saying he sees you and he has a place just for you, tailor-made just for you. Lord, break the spirit of comparison over our lives where we are hindered to move forward because we keep comparing ourselves to someone else. Lord, you have a plan for each one. 
Help us, my God, by your grace to step in fully. God, help us to be fully obedient, that our children will not fight the enemies we fail to destroy, my God, but help us to be Mordecai's in this hour, I pray, my God, that will confront the Hamans and say, not on my watch. You've run through my family long enough, but now you run into me, and today it ends with me. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray courage on your children. Courage, Lord, I'm asking you give a grace to the Mordecais to arm the Esthers with courage for this hour. Lord, cause our Esthers, our young people, I speak over our young people, arise, stand up. Stand up in your position. Let no one look down on you because you're a youth. But the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Wield your gifts, your talents. Allow God to position you for influence. Don't look at your friends. Don't compare yourself. Lord, I'm asking where there is an attitude that I'm going to play games for as long as possible. And at some point, I'll get serious with God. Today it ends, God, I'm asking in the name of Jesus. Burn our hunger and a passion in our young people, I pray, my God. Cause a revival to stir in their hearts, my God. No compromise, no compromise, my God, I pray, but a courage to stand for righteousness. Lord, I'm asking even now, those that are standing, would you connect them, Lord, I pray. Cause connections, divine connections within even this house, my God, I pray, of Mordecai's and Esther's. God, help us to realize the impact we can have. As we give of ourselves a heart that is sacrificed, surrendered, obedient, my God. Help us to realize the impact that we can have on another generation and another generation and another generation. Lord, that our legacy, our influence, our impact will go on and on and on. Lord, I pray the same grace the same anointing that rested on Mordecai and Esther may it rest on us now, I pray. Lord, arm us with courage, I pray. Lord, here we are, surrendered before you. Here we are, God. Would you use us? God, let us not get confused and caught up thinking that it always has to be some grand event. Lord, when I touch one child, when I impact one child, I impact generation. Give us hearts, Lord, for the next generation. Give us a burden, Lord, I pray. Help us as Mordecai's to not stand in judgment of our youth. But to invest, Lord, with love, with time, with counsel, with help, I pray. Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for your word this morning. I pray, my God, let us not walk out of this door and forget what you've spoken to our hearts this morning. But, Lord, I pray it would take root. It would bear fruit. We seal your word with the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. We have a song item.